Welcome back. It's your host Jay here with another episode of the Over Manga Cast. That time he woke up in a podcast and had to explain manga. Our heated adventures over analyzing manga we find interesting. But this isn't just any episode. Gosh, it feels like just yesterday. But on this episode, we're actually celebrating the podcast's second. You heard that right. Two years. We'd love to thank all of our beloved guests and supporters, and yes, even our haters, for helping us reach this incredible milestone. But fear not, more incredible programming is in the pipeline, and we really do appreciate your comments and feedback, so reach out to us on all of our socials and drop us a line and make any suggestions. We really do take those to heart. Now, without further ado, in celebration of our podcast birthday, Here's a series about a bunch of kids that unfortunately won't get to see theirs. So, on this next episode, we read The Promised Neverland, chapters 1 through 9 by Kao Shirai. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Anyway, let's go! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Overmanga Cast. My name is Sam, and as always, here at the top of the show, we like to talk about what our familiarity with the franchise that we read this week is. Hey, Jake, you want to tell them about how I first heard about the Promised Neverland? Trap in. This is a story. So, first of all, I'm going to commit a content creator sin and say if you've not actually watched the first episode of Promised Neverland, or if you haven't like read a couple of the first chapters of the manga. Put this episode on pause and experience the series blind. Seriously, it's really important. The experience of not knowing what this story is about is important to how it hits you the first time. And I learned this because when it was coming out, uh, the Mother's Basement YouTube channel was doing a bunch of videos on it because Jeff Thu was a big, big fan of the first season of Promised Neverland. I was watching his videos pretty religiously at the time, and I said, okay, what's this Promised Neverland thing? The thumbnail looks kind of cool. What's what's going on here? And he beseeches the audience the way I just did. And the thing is, I watched School Live Club on his recommendation in a video where he spilled the tea on the big first episode spoiler. Like, right. What the hell could be the twist in this show? I basically marathoned the entire first season over the course of about 72 hours. Mm -hmm. The entire time, over Discord chat, I am all caps screaming at (laughs) Sam. So he's concerned. It was kind of funny, but I was still terrified. So eventually... The scene that was scaring me shitless had ended, and I could explain in coherent human words that I was watching an anime now. You need to see this, but I also need to see your your actual physical face, your reactions to this, because oh my god. And that is, and that is the story of how Jake entrapped uh, me and another one of our friends into uh, watching the first episode of Promise Neverland. I basically repeated what he did and then binged it uh, over the next three days. And, and proceeded to scream at me for most of the same scenes, yes. The other funny thing is, after I watched the first season, I actually did watch those you know, like YouTube videos discussing elements of the plot. And what? one of the things that Jeff Thu mentioned is that watching... Promise Neverland after you've seen the whole series with someone who has no idea what's going on and watching the dawning dread and horror as they realize how bad the situation is. That is a unique experience onto itself that I think everyone needs to experience. So that was my experience. (laughs) So Matt and Jay, how about you guys? (laughs) So, um, Matt actually introduced this to me, and I think, remind, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I think our reaction was a little different, because I think this was, like, one of the first things I hypothesized, and because of that, I, I don't remember the, how many, how far of a separation there was, but we also came from Penguin Drum, so Penguin Drum, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but there are bad things that happen to children in that. So, yeah, to to clarify, one of my favorite genres is terrifying horror in a cute setting. Yeah. So, um, when I say, hey, want to watch this cute thing? There is um, 
there's expectations there. <laughs> yeah. So, so, like, legitimately, I think this is like the second thing I arrived on. They're like, those kids are being eaten, aren't they? And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> so. Unfortunately, Sam and Jacob I had less of a visceral reaction, so it probably would not have been as satisfying to watch, <laughs> watch it. The really uh, funny, the really funny thing about my experience watching it with with people blind is that Sam at least had a vague idea that it was actually a horror series, despite how like cutesy it was. Our other friend legitimately had no clue at all what was happening. <laughs> and like see, seeing Sam on guard the whole time, his guard slowly slipping and then popping back up when something horrifying happened. <laughs> and then our other friend completely blindsided by the end of the first episode <laughs> was just unbelievable. <laughs> it was peak, yeah. <laughs> so all this is to say... I do have prior experience with this series. Yeah, yeah, both both me and Jay have seen all of season one of the anime. Um, this is the first time reading the manga, though, and there are, there are definitely differences. Yeah, first time reading the manga as as well. Like, this is a manga podcast. We're here to focus on the manga, and we'll, uh, I'll try my level best, but I honestly do think that there's a really cool compare and contrast between the two. And before we get into the story, I think one element that I wanted to bring up is... I think that your first blind experience with The Promised Neverland should be the anime because one of the big differences is because it's animated, it has a greater control over the pacing of the story. Like the manga is just as tense and scary, but the way that like the dread can be uh, can be built with precision because, you know, it's like you can pause it, but you can't like... You can't like control how fast or how long the stairs go, you know? Yeah, you can't control uh, the speed at which you turn the page. I also think the manga is a little more upfront with how tense it is. Mm. I think the anime plays up the cutesiness in the first episode to get you that like shocking tone shift at the end to really like hook people on watching the entire series. Whereas the manga, I guess, assumes you have a built-in audience of like, hey, 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 creepy, creepy, huh? Yeah, uh, creepy stuff. Like they're they're both excellent in different ways, but I do think a first experience of Promise Neverland, I, I I think the anime is a little bit better just because of the nature of the pacing of it. That doesn't make the anime better, mind you, because like there's actually a lot to the manga I really enjoyed that was just completely absent in the anime adaptation. Another, another fun thing is when you go back to Promise Neverland, uh, you notice things. The like cover page uh, for the manga and for the anime. Uh, ha- when when uh, Sam noticed that the uh, the hands of the clock were fork and knife. <laughs> 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 yeah. For example. Uh, but um. So to actually get into it. Yeah, we're beating around the bush here. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, The manga opens up uh, at a a rather picturesque orphanage. Look at all these. uh, Look at all these. Wonderful, happy children where nothing bad is going to happen. They aren't my real family, but they're my adopted family. And they're great. And I'll love them for. So people who rewatch the anime, it's. um... Oh, what's main girl's name? Emma. <laughs> Emma. It, Emma. So people who watch the anime, is Emma this direct in the narration in the anime? I don't. So it has been a while since I've watched the anime, so I don't quite remember. Yeah, I don't think I don't think the narration was nearly as prominent. I don't even remember if there was a lot of narration in the anime. Um, one thing that I actually find sort of interesting is that um, uh, one of the big differences between Emma in the anime and manga is that manga Emma it, it's almost more of a plucky shonen protagonist in the wrong show than the manga uh, than the anime version is which is hilarious because one thing that this series does so well regardless of its form is it couches the horror in the aesthetic of a completely different genre and no matter how on guard you are that always like seeps in and like that makes everything creepy so much more creepy because like Emma shouldn't be in a story like this. Oh, 
I, I love how they get away with like the tense atmosphere too of like, ah, yes, the Grace Field House. It's where we're orphans, we're raised by mother, like everything's great and picturesque. There's only one thing that's weird. We're not allowed to go past the wall, uh, the fence in the woods. And every day we take these elaborate tests and it's like, it's sudden and it's tense. But because you're used to reading shonen manga and there's always this garbage, you're like, oh no, this is probably like, yeah, this is how they have superpowers. Yeah, yeah this, is takes- like some, this is like some superhuman program or whatever, you know, for, for prodigies. That, that's why they have to uh, take these exceedingly elaborate math tests with these barcode readers. One yeah. of one of my absolute favorite elements of the Promised Neverland as a story is they have numbers tattooed on their necks. Mm-hmm. 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 It yeah. is one of those things where you see it and you're like, I wonder what that's about. And you never expect it's exactly what you think it is, you idiot. Of course, it's that. How could it be literally anything else? Well, here's but- the thing, Jacob. Because shonen manga is garbage, you just have <laughs> protagonists who have weird tattoos that mean nothing. <laughs> no, I mean, like, the first, like, where my mind went um, initially was because I think around this time period, I was also watching Dead Man Wonderland. Mm. So it was like, oh, my God, are these kids prisoners of some, like, that's why I say it was like one of the two things that I thought of immediately once I saw how cute it was. And once I saw the numbers tattoos, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> they broke the one child policy yeah. oh geez but it's like they're they get all of the like odd stuff out of the way pretty pretty swiftly you know they have these regimented lives they le- uh they lead these regimented lives they wear pure white clothes they have the id numbers on their necks they take the mandatory daily test where everyone looks like they're about to <laughs> shoot themselves with fear <laughs> That's a, that's a sentiment that continues this entire this entire reading and it's gorgeous but that's like that's like a half a dozen pages in this opening chapter and then it cuts to mom being like wow our three main characters you guys all got perfect scores on the test amazing job i'm so proud of you let's go play outside kids and it it gets like happy and peppy again it's Again, it's this element of the fear comes from a a unsettling like it's like the uncanny valley. But instead of a face that's not quite right, it's a situation that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. Like you you want to put out of your mind, like like you naturally want to put out of your mind the neck tattoos, but they're just there. (laughs) You can't not see them. I'm just skeptical about any medium. Well, specifically in Japan that has to do with young children. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I'm very skeptical. <laughs> and this is probably because I didn't pay attention um so closely to, you know, like happier genres like Pokemon or Digimon or uh, any of the other monster genres. So, when I watched mostly a lot of shows or or read manga with young children, it was not always a good time. <laughs> Right. Well, not always a good time for the characters. I very much enjoyed my experience with Promise Neverland. That's just not the case for the protagonists. Mm-hmm. But oh. uh, we we should introduce our three uh, primary characters. We have uh, they are the three oldest kids at the fa- at the. Uh, Don't spoil, Sam. <laughs> they're the three oldest kids at the orphanage: Norman, Ray, and Emma. They're all 11 years old, otherwise known as the Shonen protagonist age. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Are you ready for your Shonen adventure? See, uh, all the kids at the place are between uh, 6 and 12. Uh, they always get adopted by 12 years old. Yes. Them's the rules. Them's the rules. Well, they specifically say foster families, so th- that's at least believable that it's a regimented process. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like they use them in, like interchangeably, and it turns out it doesn't matter anyway. Well, that's well, actually the whole thing, isn't it? <laughs> or like the the cover story isn't that suspicious. It's like oh, okay, they've got like a cutoff di- like a a cutoff age for an orphanage isn't insane. Twelve's kind of weird, but maybe you've got like that's a really, that's really high. You've got a separate yeah. place for teenagers because they probably shouldn't be around. Like you know, it makes sense. Uh, this is the last day for uh, one of the uh, six-year-old uh, orphans, uh, Connie. 
Poor mm. dumb Connie. <laughs> yeah, Connie's, Connie is canonically a dumbo. It's, it's literally her introduction panel is like, well, Connie, you were great. You never did good on the test, but. <laughs> or like athletically, like she was not only like intellectually not that great. She also like stumbled out of her own feet and everything. She was really shy and scared easily. And it was just like all around. Eh. Yeah, ma- maximum endearing for uh, this character that's getting <clears throat> adopted. Look at this adorable wooby. <laughs> Look at small child. Do you not wish to protect? Look, mm. she even drew a picture of uh, th- this like crummy little picture of herself and mom and her uh, and her stuffed rabbit that she takes everywhere. That she except, takes every- dur- except during the inciting incident. Mm hmm. <laughs> Honestly, mom should have been perceptive. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to point this out for how super genius all the characters are in this real dumb play right here. Yeah. Remember this plot element, dear readers, because it will come up later. I remember how that uh, ties into the later story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nothing in this uh, manga is there as uh, simple set dressing. Nothing is accidental. Everything is is part of a greater wheels within wheels plan. The pace of this manga was reading Death Note and then went hold my beer. (laughs) (laughs) Connie forgot uh, the stuffed rabbit. And so naturally, Emma being best older sister, best older sister that she can be uh, is like, we have to we have to go take the rabbit to her. And Norman's like, but uh, mom left the house. And every time mom leaves the house, she locks the place up. So how are we going to get out? Norman's like, don't worry. I, ha- I have uh, proficiency in thieves tools. I can pick the lock. Almost literally says that, <laughs> which again, <laughs> on purpose, that comes up later. <laughs> we can get in trouble together later. I love Norman. Oh. <laughs> Most Norman's relatable funny. character. <laughs> <laughs> with with a rare few exceptions uh, for good reason, Norman o- almost always has this like sleepy smile on his face. <laughs> yeah, it, it, he only loses it when something abject horrifying is happen is happening, yeah. which is at least once a chapter. <laughs> we mentioned earlier that the one place they're not allowed to go is past the fence in the forest, but there's actually two places. Uh, the other one is the gate uh, out of the Gracefield complex. I think the gate is on the other side of the fence, I thought, but. Oh, no, it's like down a road. Yeah, it's down a road. The fence goes to the gate. Mm hmm. It's the the forest rings their home and there is a fence at the at the edge of their of allowed area in the forest. It's a very oddly built yard, I understand. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a giant circle, um, though. Another thing that, uh, you know, if you if you're going to keep reading further and or like, you know, the situation where you don't already know, um, they do have a flashback of um, particularly uh, one thing that we learned about Ray uh, early on is that he is an extremely motivated care or un, uh, extremely unmotivated character. He doesn't like doing things. That's way too much work. He's just going to sit down and read. Uh, he just slumps against trees all day. Be with it with his black hair that hangs over one over eye, one eye. The edgy anime kid. Yes, that he, yes. Is. He, he is Sasuke. He speaking, is Sasuke. Speaking of D&D tropes, uh, we, we made the joke about Norman having the proficiency in thieves tools, but Ray is that rogue. You know, <laughs> <Yes>. the one. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, as uh, Emma and Norman are going to take the rabbit to uh, give it back to Connie so that she can have it on her way to her uh, foster family, Emma and I think it's specifically Emma that recalls this, uh, the time when uh, Ray insisted they go uh, check out the gate just to see what it was like. How about that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't come up during our reading, but if if, uh, if you read along with us and, and are planning on continuing... Remember that it comes up again. <laughs> Emma and Norman go into the gate and uh, there's nobody around. There's just a truck uh, sitting there. And mm-hmm. it, 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 there's such a cute moment of Emma being like, wow, it's a real truck. I've never seen one before. I still don't know what genre of manga I'm in yet. <laughs> anyway, I don't see any people around. Connie's not here. Uh, maybe I'll just put the rabbit in the back of the truck and she'll find it later. And you turn the page and that's Connie's dead body with a flower planted into her chest. 
Not right. just the dead body. Obviously, it was very traumatic because her like eyes are bulging out of it. Like, I mean, it's not mm-hmm. like oh, there's just she's just sleeping and like she's not dead. She's dead. Dead. This this reveal, like the manga. This is a full page. This is intense. This is the corpse of a six year old with bulging eyes. Like. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is. There's no shading. It just shows you what this manga is about. And I'm like, oh, I remember watching the anime. Like I had suspicions. And then there was just me going, I can't believe they put a dead child on TV. Right? <laughs> like, I feel like my reaction, initial reaction was messed up, obviously, because one, I was shocked to see that. And two, I like maniacal laughter because I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that, and I, I'm like Norman and Emma are wandering into the gate. They're wa- they're walking up to the truck, and I'm 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 saying out loud to Jake, two kids going to die tonight. Two kids going to die tonight." They open the back of the truck. One kid already died tonight. <laughs> It, it was it was quite wonderful uh, watching my friends live reactions to this. They had the same expression that Emma and Norman did. <laughs> Just, Blank shock and amazement, and this isn't real, right? No, it is. It's very real. It is very real. Yes, and and then we see the thing that did the thing, and it gets worse. <laughs> oh my god! Because uh, naturally, the kids hide under the truck. Because why wouldn't you? As some uh, as someone approaches. And Trust the Norman being able to think in this time. I literally, I I would not have been able to move. Oh, yeah. Like, these are tiny, small children, and these things are... <laughs> that's that's mm-hmm. honestly that's honestly a really cool and good, important moment of characterization, because Norman is the first to react, but Emma does, too. And this manga does such a good job. Actually, I think that's one of the things I think the manga does even better than the anime, is it really conveys how damn smart these kids are Mm -hmm. like all of the kids like this is a like when we get into like the psychological battles and like the conflict like the proper conflict of the story one thing that is immediately established is everybody is a fucking genius like and it feels like everyone is smarter than you are you Mm -hmm. know it is wild but i gotta say I absolutely adore the panel where they reveal the demons. This manga plays a lot with uh, perspective in the paneling, and it it kind of messes with the space, like where characters are presently in the space. But I think that's to the benefit of the horror styling, because uh, like Emma is under the truck peeking out at what is uh at what just entered the room and it's this massive looming creature and it's long nailed hand is dangling its and- hands are entirely too long it is uh-huh. deeply unsettling i love the demons in this like they look I, so cool oh and they don't like hide them in shadow either they just let them be front and center on the page and just disturbing and yeah. I love it for that. I, I honestly think one of the most disturbing factors of it, or obviously when they start to communicate, it just sounds like regular. They're just person. dudes doing a job. It's literally like mouth does sounds do not make sense with what I'm seeing right now. Mm-hmm. Like like they're blue collar workers bitching about their shitty job. Yep. <laughs> it's insane. Mm-hmm. And like there there's a truism in horror that you know, never show everything. Always keep something hidden because the audience will always conjure something more horrifying in their minds than what you can actually make manifest through your medium. And man, that is 99% of the time true. But Promise Neverland is the one is one of the very rare exceptions where no, the horror works because it does not hide it. I I think to to a large extent, it's because it is threatening children and children so often don't actually get damaged in Mm -hmm. media. So by showing everything, by not cutting away from anything and it gets worse, uh, I'm I'm referring to something that's later than our reading, but like, dear listener, it gets worse. Uh, The fact that it is so upfront about how horrifying it gets works so heavily in its favor i I like how mundane they make it i think that doubles down on the horror of like 
they make this thing that is so horrible you would probably never expect to even see it feature prominently in a shonen manga and they talk about it like they're just taking out the trash really a mass like deeply psychological disillus- disillusionment because this is obviously like literally run-of-the-mill day-to-day stuff for everyone else it's just like you guys all of a sudden just happen to break routine and just happen to see this and it's oh, just like you know that that page you just freaked out about that's so common this probably isn't these guys like only stop for the day yeah yeah like <laughs> it is it is genuinely one of the most horrifying like like mm. it's the difference between horror and terror like we're this is like subnautica levels of terror uh-huh. like awaken the faculties terror emma and norman are there under the truck listening to these two delivery men talk and they're like ah, it looks so tasty i just want to take a bite no you idiot this is high quality stuff for the uh for the up and ups you can't just take a bite out of that. It's not for rubes like us. Now, come on. We need to get on our way. Uh, and you'll have and the then- next you'll have the next shipment ready when we come back. Right. And mom walks out understood because the whole time Emma is thinking, oh, no, mom was here. What's happened to her? It, it has been several years since I originally watched the anime and. So I wasn't entirely sure how I would react to, you know, the twist again in chapter one. I as I was reading through, I saw the first instance of mom appearing and my entire body started tensing up. (laughs) I'm like, oh, crap, it's her. It's a lady. So bad lady. She hadn't even started being threatening yet in the story, but I was immediately put into a fear response. Like, so to say that uh, it, this uh, this uh, story had some lasting emotional effects on me. <laughs> it lingers. It lingers. Yeah, it, it, like the the way that, and I do think I do think in a lot of cases the manga is a bit more blunt about it, which works for the medium. But like the way that like. When you know, like, like it's it's like Plato's allegory of the cave. It seems insane to someone who doesn't know about it. Mm-hmm. But like when you can see that that shadow isn't real, you know, it 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 changes the meaning of it. You know, you, like that that shadow on the wall goes from just being a shadow on the wall to the monster right behind you. Mm-hmm. And like it, everything about the place, about about like yeah, you know, everything about the, about the fence, about... the shape of it, the <laughs> all of the weird inconsistencies, the fucking net tattoos. Of course, they're cattle. Like, <laughs> yep, it was exactly what you thought it was, but didn't think it would be that because that's too horrifying. Yep, and uh, Emma is much like the viewer probably desperately trying to rationalize this away but norman brings her down to reality no that was connie this is real this is not a simulation we We have to do something about it yep (laughs) we end the chapter with the uh with the terrible terrible realization that uh, they are food they need to escape and oh, right, when they were fleeing the gatehouse, they left the bunny behind. So mom and the demons know someone was there. A very common through line throughout all of the Promise Neverland, at least as far as any of us have seen, is the final thing that we see is Emma and Norman return, returning and um, Ray asks them, did you make it in time? And both of them, with the most f***ing grim looks on their face, just walk past him and say no and nothing else. We didn't make it. And later on, Ray's very perceptive. People like keeping secrets and, and, and loyalties and, you know, who knows what it like. Again, when you know, when you're looking at everything in retrospect, it, it all like you all see it together. But in the moment, like trying to parse what anybody's reactions mean, because the slightest twitch could be the clue that, you know, keeps you from being discovered and shipped off to be eaten by a demon. <laughs> like the psychological 
aspect of it is so terrifyingly well crafted. So yeah, um, Soylent Green is people. Uh, <laughs> these kids are veal, and uh, this particular uh, orphanage is a farm for their highest quality meat. Boy, well, at least I'm high quality, right? <laughs> 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 Good news, kids! You're premium. I'm yeah, like that, copy. That dumby was low quality beef. <laughs> That's why she went out at six instead of uh, twelve. I love the way that um, diegetically the characters are having the same realizations that the that the view that the reader is because in the next chapter, Emma's uh, Emma, Norman, and Ray they bring Ray into it, obviously, because he's you know the third member of the trio uh he follows them when uh emma and norman, norman. are hiding a makeshift uh, a makeshift rope that they built because they go past the fence and find past the fence is a wall mm-hmm. yeah no this is not to protect us <laughs> this is a cage emma about the same time the reader is just like or in the same process that the reader would is like oh wait a minute it's always the kids that score low on the test that go at younger ages. Norman, Ray, and I are the highest scoring ones. Oh, the demons were talking about wanting to harvest those high performers. Wait, we're the high performers. Oh no. That means they want our brains. Yeah, like trying to parse why they would frame this farm as an orphanage. Like, why would they why would they do the test? What value does that have for the quality of their meat? They're able to parse out that as the human brain develops, there's certain breakpoints uh, at age six is a break point, And at age 12 is a break point in terms of brain development. Or it, it's sweetbreads. Yes. But uh, now is the point where uh, we reach one of my favorite like subgenres of thriller, which is the uh, basically the more serious version of the Samurai Jack. I knew that you knew that you knew that I knew that I knew that you knew bit. <laughs> <laughs> that is the promised neverland it is a deadly serious full clench terrifying version of that and it becomes this incredibly elaborate game of not tipping your hand you know we're playing poker don't keep your hand close to your chest keep your cards like inside your sternum that's how secretive we need to be right now because any screw up will literally be, you know, your butt on the plate. <laughs> and like, like there are elements of like intentionally, uh, intentionally revealing information to get information for yourself. Um, you know, one of the one of the early things that ends up happening after all of this is Isabella. I refuse to call her mom. That's what we <laughs> learn her name eventually is. Isabella has a a thing that looks like a pocket watch. And one of the kids get lo- gets lost, so she makes a show of pulling out the pocket watch, studying it closely, and then walking into the forest to find the kid who fell asleep in the woods. I know two of you were at the gate and saw something. I don't know who the two of you are. But you is, would have noticed this. Is the implication. And, like, the brilliant thing is that scene that Jake just described, that happens at, like, the end of the day it's the afternoon sun's going down we need to get in and get ready for dinner so the fact that the tracking device is disguised as a pocket watch it makes perfect sense it's like she's checking the time but then she walks into the woods when one of the other kids you know very specifically lost this other child and doesn't know where they are and she returns scant minutes later like that's way too quick it's like she beelined directly there. And that's the that's the game that's being played. That's the level of like bluff and hand tipping and spider web weaving. I love it. Unbelievably intense. And yet it's so enrapturing. Like <clears throat> a lot of times, like something that's like super high intensity can get exhausting really fast. But the thing that really works for Promise Neverland is it's so enrapturing you lose yourself and the amount of time you've spent on this just disappears. It it doesn't want to feel exhausting because it wants to like, it wants to keep you abreast of all the information. It doesn't want to scare you away. So you'll forget something and then, you know, not have the opportunity to see it coming. Cause like seeing it coming just a second too late is something that this series is unbelievably good at. 
like it keeps you it keeps you turning the page you know also i gotta say like reading this in a manga format i love how each chapter ends on a stinger and it's just it's they don't feel cheap they're just legitimately good stingers which is very hard to do so lovely to see like Mm -hmm. uh, so about that stinger uh mom is inches away from emma's face now (laughs) (laughs) oh my goodness this... Uh, this is this is where the screaming started when I was watching the anime, by the way. This is <laughs> the scene I screamed the most at, but it was a close second. At this point, you know, our our heroes are still trying to get their footing and figure out how they have to proceed. It's like, OK, what do we know? We know that mom is our enemy. She can somehow track our location and she knows that someone was at the gate, but not who. So how do we figure out more information without revealing ourselves? In the middle of all this, you know, intense espionage, Emma has a very human moment uh, of looking at uh, a wall where, you know, a whole bunch of like little drawings the kids put up uh, are. Connie's drawing was taken down the uh, that day. Hmm, how about that? <laughs> yeah, it's and it was the middle one in the like square. So it's a very obvious missing hole. But that was done on purpose. <laughs> exactly like it it, it's the most obvious like trap metaphor and uh, that's exactly why connie's drawing was placed in the center Mm -hmm. on the off chance anyone accidentally found out they were on a farm that way no (laughs) honestly with how deep the plans go i would not be shocked so like emma has a brief like human moment of like looking at the looking at the wall you know places her hand on the empty spot where the drawing was She's like, morning, Connie. We have to do our best. We have to get out of here. Next panel, full page, zoom in. Mom is there, like, right in Emma's face. <laughs> like, predatorily staring at her. I don't know how wanna, to describe uh-huh. it. <laughs> you want to talk about, you want to talk about deft use of perspective in this manga. Boy, that fish eye shot. <laughs> I would just say, yeah. you gotta, that's the thing that was really really ticked off um not ticked off but really tipped me off to the to the tenor of this genre was just because this is not the only instance there's a lot of predatory looks from various individuals and it's just Mm -hmm. unsettling (laughs) yeah one of the things that i really like is the change between the way mom's character design it's a it's a subtle shift in it but uh the perspective has her face appear a lot like rounder and softer in chapter one until the reveal and then at every other point she is very severe in her aspect yeah she 100 percent knows what she's doing too it's very much an act and uh that works great here by making her extremely imposing like that could just be a uh a, a rather bland expression if you didn't have all of the context and she like leans in, brushes Emma's cheek, brushes her hair back. Uh, and Emma, Emma's like, oh, she's checking my reaction. I need to not give anything away. And this kid has ice in her blood. I love this moment from Emma because mm-hmm. she does her plucky shonen protag best smile. What's wrong, Emma? You seem worried oh it's nothing i'm just a little sad that connie's gone but i'm sure i'll see her again someday okay i noticed this mom not only brushes emma's like neck to check her pulse and like her cheek to see if she's sweating also her ear to check the tracking device (laughs) something that comes up later in our reading but they do find the location of the the tracking devices it's implanted in the ear yeah and one other thing that I think is an important note is uh, what what you mentioned, Sam, about there being like a noticeable difference between uh, Isabella in the, the beginning of the first chapter and then the entire rest of her being in the story. You can notice brief moments in the first chapter where there's something off. You know, there's a coldness, a distance that doesn't jive with her otherwise seemingly genuine nature like and and this is true for all the characters but isabel is a really good example of like there are some cases where she's turning on the charm Mm -hmm. and she goes back to chapter one rounder self just long enough for it to be creepy when 
you know, the real her comes back, you know, yeah. and it really is the matter. Nothing's changed. It's just that Emma Norman and Ray can see the mask now. It's not that the mask is slipping. It's that they know she's wearing one. It's one of those tiny, imperceptible things that you only notice because you already know it's there. You know That's a theme. Like. It's just so freaking intense. Norman and Emma are, you know, rightfully freaking out about uh, once they're alone and away from her about how ridiculously tense this situation is. They're just kids. They're not built for this. <laughs> Emma at one point physically collapses. Adults would not be able to handle this situation. It uh, speaks to how strong these kids are. And, uh, I love the way this chapter ends because um, this entire time mom has been in this very, I, again, the word uh, of the day is severe, the severe getup, high collared, long sleeved, uh, uh, skirt goes down to her ankles. You know, she's wearing pants under the skirt, you know, austere, austere, completely covered up, you know, mm -hmm. hair in a tight bun. And the final panel of this uh, chapter after the confrontation with, uh, with Emma and she's like, okay, Emma didn't uh, reveal anything. She didn't uh, like crack. I need to keep searching. I need to find the, the ones who were there that day. I'm the one who's going to survive. She unbuttons the collar and it reveals she's got the exact same like ID tattoo on the neck. Mm -hmm. It's one of those ones where I love this because that's something that you should be able to infer. Like this, this makes so much sense. And man, is Promise Neverland good at slowly letting the truth creep into the back of your head just long enough for you to think, no, yeah, that is that is the genius of the very first reveal. And the reason why this is one of those series where spoilers really do matter that much. So obviously, now that we're a good chunk into the episode, I hope you did the reading. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why Jake had his big spoiler warning at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. One thing I want to point out about this, I like uh, Mama's tattoo. Uh, her number is way higher than the kids. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the next bit is actually uh, really cool from reading the manga. One thing that the Promise Neverland manga does so well is world building. Because mm -hmm. like this, this next bit is what the kids realize is there is like they need information because the simple fact is they have no idea what's going on. They just know that if they don't get out of here, they will die. So they start. What is the oldest published book in the house? Newest published book. Mm -hmm. Or Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the newest published book? Um, It's from 2015. OK, well, it's it's been like about 30 years it from that. Like the, the book is that old. Because the year is 2045 in the story. Which is interesting because they obviously, well, in the world building, they actually are aware of some like current events and, and like they are allowed obviously to learn and read about real events and everything because that is, as we learned, somewhat valuable. They don't exactly know why or when they'll be using this information. But I mean, it is, I guess... What stood out to me is it's very odd they're able to learn accurate information. Yeah, the fact that they're given the truth is weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, uh, I think this actually happens a little later, but Norman's got a great line of like, wait a second. This entire setting we're in is anachronistic to the time period we're set in. What's going on here? And I'm like, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if, good... if, if all they were trying to do was to activate their um cerebral cortex and you know make those valuable brains or use those psychological muscles so to say they could have just made up whatever they wanted for all we know they could have made up whatever language the heck they wanted. well see here jay here's the problem the demons prefer the taste of facts and it turns out that if you feed children falsehoods, they become actors and their brains are just not very tasty. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Makes perfect sense to me. But it, it is weird that it's like, because we get a lot of indications that Gracefield is a very unique establishment in this system. It's premium. It's premium. It's the best. It's, it's essentially free range. <laughs> free range yes. beef. They are the and, Wagyu. There has to be something to giving 
to nurturing their natural curiosity while still obscuring the truth. So they kind of have to walk that fine line of essentially doing creative world building with reality. <laughs> it just seems like you could just tell them the current year is when the last book was published. Seems. Ah, uh, like like the village. Oh, you know, these are Sherlock Holmes level intelligence kids. They'd probably be like, hmm, judging by the age of this book, this doesn't seem conducive with the exactly. mud found outside of London's bathhouse district. Why, Holmes, <laughs> how do you know what the mud outside London's bathhouse district is? <laughs> Watson, shut up. <laughs> like I'm saying, like they could have completely en encased them and allowed them to believe that they were subsisting in this own ecosystem similar to like the... Sh Shyamalan the village or something Shyamalan like that. Shyamalan the village. Yes. <laughs> the village. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, similar to your bit about Sherlock Holmes, uh, my my take is like, I mean, they they live on this idyllic little farm. They can just look up at night and see the stars. And eventually one of them is going to figure out, wait a minute. it And, you know, they host like... Uh, Oh, our kids at a range of ages. So it's not like they can just keep cycling through 2015 over and over and over again. Well, one of them would eventually woke up and be like, hey, wait a minute. The stars aren't right for what this year is supposed to be. Or no, they don't teach kids astrology because demons come from the moon. That is that Again, is possible. It goes, it goes I, back I to it. we need to figure out what's going on well, on the moon. Because in their little research thing, they say we here's a map of the world, and then it's a map of like our world. And I'm like, okay, well, we're going with demons have invaded our world. That's fine. Um, and then from that, they then go, we don't even know where we could possibly be on this map. And I'm like, well, stars would immediately tell you that and these kids are so smart it seems like that's probably just knowledge they don't mm. like that I, seems like something you hide i well i actually yeah because uh they they only generalize where they are based on uh based on, on the season the, on the seasons mm -hmm. we can't be um, equatorial because we actually have a four season cycle uh so we have to be somewhere in the middle latitudes and uh yeah they know enough about the stars to know that they're in the northern hemisphere yeah, but I mean, like, I think I think the way that Sam put it is actually the most accurate. The uh, the demons need to do creative world building with reality because they want the kids to be smart because brain good. Uh, but they also don't want them to be so smart that they'll, you know, figure things out. <laughs> like, man, where where is like the factory farm of children where they just let them watch cartoons and eat candy? It's just like, <laughs> I want some nice mushy brains. <laughs> That's a good question, actually. <laughs> well, you see, after the moon demons were kicked off of their uh, moon home by Santa Claus in the Lunar <laughs> Civil War, they tried that. <laughs> I knew it. This is in the close first. I'm telling you. Yes. We need to figure out what's going on on the moon. Oh, God. What's even going on in the thing we read? Uh, <laughs> that, is a, that is a good question. Um, is this uh, is this when they recruit Ray finally and there's that great interaction where. Um... Yes. Yeah, this is where yes. they this is where they uh, deal Ray in and he's like, all right, so the three of us need to get out. Uh, I know it's going to be a, a tragedy, but we have to leave the other kids behind. And Emma just goes, no. She so, plucky shonen pro tags all over the only smart decision to make. And, well, and Norm it's also, let's also go over the fact that Ray receives his information like, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> this becomes relevant later. <laughs> oh, my favorite thing is Ray then goes, hey, by the he then proceeds to rat out Norman going like, yeah, Norman wasn't going to tell you because um, he knew this all along. He's super smart. He knew you guys aren't carrying nine babies with you. Like, I, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's not a solution. <laughs> but Shonen Protag. And I, Norman's just like, but, but I loves her. <laughs> I do, I do like that Ray's response is, okay, so Emma, I'm going to deal you in on this one. Norman was going to betray you and make you leave the kids behind. No, I wasn't. What do you mean? No, you weren't. <laughs> you always do the logical thing. And he's just like, I loves her. 
I don't remember if the anime is this out front with it, but the manga is just a panel like, nah, nah, I really like her and I'm willing to just basically do whatever she wants. Okay, Norman, cool. <laughs> it, it's compelling character drama and uh, I I like my optimism, so. You say optimism, but then we get the pan. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much because spoilers, but if you've read this before or watched the anime, Norman just drops a like huge plot spoiler and then they move on past it i'm like okay well that's oh yeah yeah he's uh i don't want to go into it because it's not even close to where we read but like that's true that's true you know what just just watch the just watch the freaking anime yes it's very quickly paced I, I, I think the best way of putting it is it's it's very clear in the tone because I had actually forgotten about this until I had read to that point. The thing is, you can kind of tell that Norman is resigned to the fact that this is going to fail. Like the way he talks to Ray makes it pretty clear he knows this is stupid and it's not going to work and they're going to have to compromise at some point. But he's barreling ahead with uh, Emma's optimism anyway, because he needs something to cling on to in this unfathomably awful situation that he now realizes they've been in all along. It's a really compelling character moment for him. Um, Speaking of which, whilst all this has been happening, Emma has also been having some really great character moments too, because one of the things I really like about like, like, I love the world building, and the thing I almost dovetailed into but wanted to get my first point out was one of the things that's sort of been established is that whilst Emmett is the best athlete of any of the kids there, um, she is also a genius like uh, Norman and Ray, but she's sort of considered more the, like, 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 she's more physical than the other two, and like people will talk about like like the two the the two boys are obviously smarter than emma but one thing that they do a good job of is emma picks up on things so quickly like like there there are moments where she's worried like it it, is me being the strong dummy holding the other two back but she doesn't even realize that what took those two forever to put together now that she's like paying attention to things the way that they do, she's catching on just as fast, if not faster, to the things that they have been parsing out all along. And like, I love the character moments of like, in all honesty, you kind of expect Emma to not be the kind of character that doesn't understand what she's doing is completely stupid and unrealistic. But no, she really does get it, you know? Like, like she knows that this is untenable. But she's going to figure it out. So anyway, Norman likes Emma. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they get Ray back in on this little planning thing. He's like cut and run. We got to look out for number one, which is us, which is n- number one, two and three. Yeah, because they know they have already rationalized that their time is soon approaching. So they understand. Well, they, they know they turn. Yes. They all turn 12 at the same time at the stroke of midnight, like pumpkins. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst they're uh, parsing all of this out, there, there's there's a lot of world building in this like middle section, uh, but uh, we need something to move the plot along. So, uh, hey, uh, new kid. Mm-hmm. Well, because what happened was they're trying to do investigating stuff, but they also know Mama's like onto them. Yeah, so she's so onto they're, them. They're so... doing chores. They're just they're just being used as work mules, and they're just like, we haven't had a day off. All and the they, older kids. They think it's because she's onto them and is therefore trying to keep them busy so they can't plot, which is not necessarily like untrue, but there's an ulterior motive to all of this. No, I, I love how this manga goes out of its way to make sure you know, hey, mom's smarter than these children. Mm-hmm. Like I this, hope so. These three eleven year olds aren't <laughs> outsmarting the adult. What, it, this is a shonen manga here, like yeah, uh, that's not a given. <laughs> and and I I love how um basically everything uh mom does is accomplishing three other goals in addition to her main goal. Well, and I mean like Shona abuses this, but like a bureaucrat who has not had the level of education that these genius kids have had, the kids being able to think a step ahead isn't like like, there's a reason why that gets used a lot. 
Mm -hmm. But they establish the reason why Isabella is so threatening is because they establish, they show that the, uh, the uh, ID tattoo on her neck, mm -hmm. she went through all of this too. Which is exactly why I was about to say, like, we don't know that she wasn't trained as they have been because we get, you, we see that she obviously had a similar situation. And a similar upbringing. Similar, similar upbringing. And this is also revealed where it does the whole character panel and it says that she is 31. And how many years has it been since 2015? Been approximately 30 years. So, I mean, she would have been the first round, right? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And, well, uh, no, because that book was published in 2015, so presumably there is still infrastructure, so. Yeah, so, it, still. How she, fast did the world collapse is an interesting yeah. question <laughs> that doesn't get answered. Uh-huh, and um, it also means that, you know, presuming the uh, the ship-out date of 12 years old, we don't know what, like, the training time essentially is for uh new mothers but if she was uh a, if she was one of the kids on a farm and then became a mother she's been doing this for at least at least a dozen years so yeah it makes her this incredibly compelling and menacing villain it, it really feels like uh if it weren't for the fact that the kids were these uber geniuses there wouldn't even be a story yeah like like they are squeaking out of like micro corners <laughs> to uh, not get immediately axed. I think Isabella being a genius like the kids, but older is also is sort of important for the story, because if this was a more typical shonen story, you would just have Isabella be a be a bureaucrat actually getting outsmarted by 11 year old geniuses because, like you know, that's justifiable, like, like that's narratively justifiable. But, like, it is so much more terrifying specifically because, you know, this is not this series is not going to do that. Mm -hmm. There isn't well, going to be an easy way out. And also what you'd normally do in like, as it's revealed, this is like a prison break storyline is you'd have like the super genius inmates trying to go against the security system. They spend a good chunk of time explaining there is not a security system. That wall is to keep you in here and safe from what's outside. There is nowhere you can run. And if you try and run, we'll find you. But we do get a glimmer of hope, although it doesn't come off that way, because uh, as we said, new kid, but more importantly, new adult. Yes. Oh, one of the most menacing characters. Like, talk about predatory stares. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Sister Crone is top tier. Her name is literally Crone. Like, come on! Yeah. <laughs> the smuggler go goes wild with its subtlety, but sometimes it just revels in it. Well, shown in manga, like yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, some sometimes you just need to show the body of the dead kid. Sister Crone, just she is. They somehow managed to draw every single panel of her. She always looks so menacing. Well, because she'll go between like normal menacing and then her face will contort into the Grinch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Cr Crone is very unsubtle in the manga. Last reference to the anime, I promise. Watching Sam after the, the big reveal uh, cringe every time in the OP, Sister Crone hugged the children in the OP was also quite entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, because, boy, they establish, again, they establish she is just as, uh, she is the exact same kind of threat as Isabella. <laughs> but even worse, so as her motivation is slowly unveiled, I feel like she's somehow worse. I think the important thing when comparing Sister Crone and Isabella is Sister Crone is way more mask off about everything. Mm -hmm. So her terror is up front and on display, whereas Isabella is, is her terror is she is every bit as as competent as Sister Crone. She proves multiple times that she is, in fact, more competent and the mask never slips. Like, so you have the direct physical threat of of Sister Crone literally looming over these children. And, you know, 
cool, even if you find a way of dealing with her. <laughs> it's like she's shorter than Isabella, but she's... They establish that she is uh, very, very physically capable. There's a, a, mm -hmm. a scene uh, right after she's introduced to the kids where her and Isabella speak with each other. And, and, and Isabella basically just says, I think this is also where we get her name. Isabella just says uh, to Crone's face, you are basically a guard dog because uh, two of them almost surely figured out what, what this place really is. You will watch them and do nothing else. And then we get internal monologues from Crone. Crap, I was going to try to get into her good graces and then sabotage her from within. She's not letting me do anything because she knows that's exactly what I want to do. <laughs> But more importantly, you've just revealed two of the kids know the secret and you're not shipping them off immediately. You're breaking protocol. I can also just <laughs> you've given yeah. her exactly what you want, which is to like upseat you and take over the school or the orphanage for herself, which again, like her motivation is revealed immediately. <laughs> so I'm not <laughs> sure what you meant by slow reveal. It's um, she immediately goes, ah, yes, and I'm going to become the mother. Well, now that we've introduced our new antagonist, uh, we have only a couple more chapters left in the reading. But uh, as as usual with uh, Promise Neverland, that's still a lot of content to get through. So how about we take a quick break? <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. We'll be right back after this, folks. Get ready for more uh, more terror. And welcome back to the show, folks, where last we left our poor, desperate children. They had uh, just been introduced to the, the new baby sibling and the new obstacle, the new adult, Sister Crone. They don't entirely despair yet because the kids uh, realize that this is an opportunity to gain some additional info. Uh, since they now have confirmation of a uh, wider outside system, and maybe uh, this will let them discover uh, things about how they're tracked, how the system works. And yeah, having a, having a new sibling means that they have a chance to try to figure out the tracker because like, it's not in their clothes. They've, they've checked their clothes. Uh, it has to be something like an implanted device. Like it has to be really small because none of them have any like scars on their bodies. Which I find hard to believe, you know, since they are children. Well, they're, they're also nope. raised in a garden that's meant to keep them in pristine condition. But I mean, they do run out and like play. I, yeah, but I, they're also being watched by a super powered nanny who doesn't want them to have any visible injuries. And I think it's more meant to be that they don't have any obvious medical scars. Yeah. Random childhood incident scars and implant scars look very different i would also say they just get rid of the children that have childhood incident scars <laughs> yeah that's you probable broke, you broke an arm well get off the farm you're going on clearance at demon costco the fact that that joke is probably accurate makes it worse well, <laughs> so anyway they must be picking up these trackers at Demon Costco because Ray goes through how they're completely impossible to build with any kind of human technology. And I'm like, good job, Ray. You're really just doing a giant middle finger to anyone who wanted to try and like use an engineering background to figure this out. Good. Those people don't belong in Shonen Manga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Fortunately, uh, the older girls are uh, conscripted as uh, little helpers to mom in taking care of the babies. I, uh, I love how Emma's narration is she's not sure why, because it's just like the older girls are allowed to help for some reason. I'm like, because you're being tra you're trained as potential mother candidates. I like <laughs> But uh, Emma, Emma's smart, Emma's but she's still on her character arc of actually learning to play uh, to play a few steps ahead. Well, yeah. no, her, her personality is smart, but naive like that. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's a very in character moment for her. And in fact, I, I really like this moment because like in this section, as Emma is in the process of figuring this out, she's a lot of cases down on herself, like a lot of a lot of her like self-doubt about being the dumb one of the geniuses 
really comes through in this bit whilst she's doing something that even if they had access to the babies, Norman and Ray very well might ha- not have been able to notice. Mm-hmm. Because Emma had a particular relationship with Isabella before they found out about all this. Before all this started, yeah. Oh um, yeah, I forgot. That's where they inject, they do the blood test. I didn't even think about that. Like, good job, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they're they're able to find a. It looks like a bug bite on their new sister Carol's ear I that really, uh, Emma had asked about. I re- I really like this because uh, it's Emma taking care of the baby, and it's like Emma's having this very serious center monologue, and in most of the panels she's got a very determined face on. But then, like in every other panel, she's just interacting with the baby, and the baby's being cute, and she's being uh this, this adorable older sister it was like oh why can't why can't this be unalloyed wholesome <laughs> i'm just saying can we take a second to stop here i i acknowledge that the mothers have essentially superpowers <laughs> this woman sleeps in a bedroom with nine babies yeah <laughs> that's an insane amount <laughs> She must have she must have some uh, truly supernatural mental discipline. Yes. That or they just drug the babies. 100 percent. Well, no, because that would impair their cognitive function, which is the entire point of the facility. No. So drugs. So she's got uh, supernatural mental discipline in order to. uh, No, she gives she gives she gives herself drugs. Oh, you're right. That one, that one I'd buy. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say her having incredible mental discipline is fitting for her character. But you know what? You're probably right about that one, Jay. <laughs> Either that or sound noise canceling headphones. I don't know. Just like, <laughs> it just takes one to wake up in the middle of the night and start crying for all the landmine of all nine to wake up. Yeah, and like. Gracefield has some improbably good kids. <laughs> yeah. All all of the all of the little ones are bright and cheerful and th- they're just so peppy and happy all the time. Let, let's yeah, let's not talk about the fact that two through four year olds live in a room by themselves. Uh-huh. The only the one year olds stay with mom. And I'm like, yep, because two year olds don't need any help from a parent during the night. Uh- <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my gosh. But uh Emma does note the uh, the mark on Carol's ear, and it's like, oh, that's where I remember I noticed that when I was little and mom pointed out that that's where the blood tests were taken. But that's obviously a lie. There's a lump there that is the tracker implant. And she checks her own ear. Oh, I feel it there, too. Oh, mom has a habit of brushing my hair back behind my ear. She checks for it. Oh, uh, 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 when, when I said uh, there's a theme about things uh, that you uh, would never notice unless you already knew they were there and you had to look for it. <laughs> Ray, Ray just says it out loud. <laughs> like she literally checks to see if these kids pluck these trackers out of their ears frequently with such an innocuous gesture too. like that. That should be a gesture of love and affection. And it is really an a active and disgusting betrayal of of trust their humanity which again just makes her so (laughs) threatening again making isabella this incredibly disgusting villain my favorite like little detail about the operation which is isabella's hidden underground radio chamber (laughs) ah yes this the the hidden uh control room where uh she has a whole bunch of knickknackery, including uh, the stuffed bunny rabbit. And also her ham radio, she uses to check in with Mission Control, a.k.a. Grandma. <laughs> Freaking grandmas. I always knew it. They were behind everything. It does look like something out of the 40s. It, it's like a French resistance base. Want to talk about anachronisms? <laughs> Uh, I like the stinger for this one because it's a uh, it's a whole bunch of demons gathered around a table for the feast with the with the weird murder flowers saying, ah, yes, the latest harvest will be pleasing to. <laughs> yeah, is this the part where it's revealed that the main reason she's not like pulling the ripcord on this harvest because people have found out is like we we get the weird like 
alien words being censored for like the proper nouns they're using, but it's clear whatever the meal they they need these things for is like a big ceremonial thing that they cannot miss. So she's willing to keep things buried if it just gets her through the month. If it, if it means keeping on schedule for the the harvest for I mean, it is hinted in earlier on in the reading though that if she fails or something falls through, I I believe it was like in chapter 3 um that she could potentially die herself whether you know so there is the implication of if anyone finds out i screw this up my own life is on the line for this and uh, and it, it and it's strange because the the shippers the the truck drivers uh they talk like it's a like it's a capitalist system like we're, they're just picking up the the wacky beef for the the rich uppity ups but mm-hmm. uh, then this like weird shadow cabal table is talking about how, uh, uh, yes, we must prepare the special harvest, the meal for the, the weird alien font for the proper name of their god, leader, prophet. I don't know. Something. There's something. My, my takeaway wasn't that she would have been killed if like kids had found out i i think there's a protocol for kids find out you just send them off early Mm -hmm. like you quash that in the bud like i yeah they're crone specifically says we should just report this right now nip it in the bud done like she doesn't seem like she's worried that she's in danger at that point i think that's just cost of doing business it's just this delivery is so important that there's a couple things going on at this point. There is the factor that this is a screw up on her part. And like, e- even if it's not necessarily, you know, they find out I die or anything, there is the element of um, she's beholden to their whims. So she wouldn't want to piss them off. There is also, and like again, this is just like such a good way of doing a villain. There is this sort of implication that she actually cares about the kids in a warped and twisted way and that she doesn't want them being removed early for some kind of like misplaced like maternal instinct that actually is there. And it's one of those ones where it's like she's so like two faced, even when she like conveys these ideas in a private setting it's hard to trust that that's true. Like, how deep does the lie go, you know, with her? Well, it's because what happens is they immediately say she is, like, betraying us and sending us to slaughter. And that does a complete, like, that's a re- complete reverse of what you expect a mother to be. So you expect that everything she's doing is a lie. So when she's telling the truth about something, it's even worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, geez. But yeah, anyway, she uh, gets off the phone with the Demon Council. Um, I, I'm i not sure if she was on the phone with the Demon Council or if Grandma then called the Demon Council. That's a little vague. I wasn't 100 percent sure on. Yeah, it's it's a it's a kind of a cool shove effect moment where it's like she's talking with Grandma and then it cuts to the Demon Council like discussing uh, the grandma- thing that was just said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A- and uh, and Grandma is framed only as uh, like a mouth. So it's like she's literally the mouthpiece of the Demon Council. And, you know, Grandma, the obvious familial implications are the the allusion to how a family tree works, but also the grandmother, leader of their uh, organization. They are extremely cagey about information on the demons. The fact that, like, like, we've been calling them demons because that's what the characters call them. We don't know that's what they are. Mm hmm. They could be they could be very like science fictiony aliens for all we know. They could be super warped humans. I think this is I think this is an element of uh, that sort of idea of I, I mentioned that one of the things that Promise Neverland does different from a lot of other horror series is the fact that it shows, you know, like it shows its hand. It shows you the horribleness. But there is an element of, you know, keeping something in the dark by, you know, not revealing too much about the antagonist 
you know, what do you call them but demons? But like, are they literally demons or are they something else entirely? What well, what's the proper noun? <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Spoiler alert, they're from set in like Middle Earth or something. Yep. They've been here the, the entire time. The Tolkien estate is pissed. I'll just let you know. <laughs> but we're we're getting a little in the weeds here. Basically, they found out about the tracking devices and Ray and Norman just brain trust together because they always got to prove that Emma got perfect scores because that's what she could get on the test. Norman and Ray got perfect scores because that's all there was to get on the tests. Like, mm -hmm. and they always got to one up everything and be like, well, no, you, what that proves is that these tracking devices, they don't tell her who they are. They don't give any discernible information other than this is cattle. It is this place because they don't care. They can find you. There is nowhere you can go. And if that's what it is, then they probably only really notify her when you destroy them. So, so that means so that means if we want to get rid of them, we can't do anything to manipulate them until right before we're trying to get out. Now, Emma, you had a crazy plan about wanting to get everyone out. We're going to need a way that we can train them. But, because, you know, because most of them are babies. Yep. Which is which is a problem when you need to survive in the wilderness and hide from demon things. The babies are also not playing tag. So this isn't really solving their problem, but we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's more the fact that not only are they not mobile, but there are still a lot of kids in the middle that will then be burdened with figuring out how they're going to carry some of the load because these are young children. Who's, who's my favorite, like the youngest kid who shows up all the time and it's on the like reading this again. I notice him over and over again. Um, Phil. Phil. I love Phil. Everyone <laughs> loves Phil. Everyone loves Phil. The real mastermind behind everything. Yeah. Is Phil the one who loves Emma so much and wants to play with Emma all the time? Yeah. Yeah. He wants he wants big sister Emma, but she's always busy with her boyfriends. <laughs> yeah, we got to turn this into a into some kind of love romance three way. I'm, I I didn't. Norman turned it into a love romance by saying, "I love Emma so much, I'll do whatever she wants." <laughs> the manga's very in your face about it, and I was surprised. Dang, <laughs> it's in their hormones. How did we end up reading Shihaya Furu again? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she has a peppy boyfriend and sad boyfriend. Mm -hmm. That's all a girl needs. Uh, uh, but uh, Emma's uh, idea for how to uh, get the kids ready for life on the lamb running from demons. She does. I do like that she uh, admits it isn't a perfect plan, but it's a good starting point is uh, we already uh, do a lot of physical activity, you know, playing tag and whatnot. And it's established in chapter one that Norman is a beast at tag, despite being uh, sickly, because he is uh, incredibly perceptive and tactical and is able to. And he's basically a eagle scout when it comes to being able to track people or uh, track things in a forest. So it's like, what if we just, you know, actually got everyone good at tag instead of tag? It's actually guerrilla warfare training. <laughs> and this. Brilliant plan. Goes off without a hitch. Oh, wait, no. It unfortunately intersects with the separate plan of Sister Crone to <laughs> terrify children into getting Isabella fired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Like, okay, Crone has a lot of weird warped faces in the anime. The panel of her going to... Uh, being like, hey kids, you want to play tag? <laughs> Just, oh, that face is going to haunt my nightmares. <laughs> She's so unsubtle, which is on purpose because the big difference between her and Isabella is that for Isabella, the mask never slips and for Crone, the mask always slips. There was yeah. no mask. Well, no, um, there is a mask. It's just unfortunately a not very good one. So it comes off as like a Halloween mask that just terrifies <laughs> you. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is this is a surprisingly accurate metaphor. Uh, but uh, Crone has decided that uh, she uh, yearns for a challenge. So it's going to be her versus all of the kids. Yeah, uh, 
it starts off as I'm going to play a mind game with these children. And then she finds out they're really good. Flashback to Isabella telling her these children are special. They're not like a normal farm. And she's like, what on earth does she mean? Oh, no, they're like super guerrilla warfare geniuses. Well, I'm going to give up playing and this is just going to be me going all out serious. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. So the game is we have 20 minutes. Uh, if Crone captures everybody, she wins. If even a single kid escapes, the kids win. And uh, go. Boy, I feel like this is foreshadowing something. Yeah. I, I gotta say, I this is one area where I, I really enjoy the manga, like to the point where I'm I'm like very either or when it comes to manga or anime this is one field where i thought the anime did better not for the visualization but for the audio uh audio aspect of it because when crone is running through the forest uh hunting down kids like the slasher villain that she is the foley artists went ham with just the sound of her boots pounding through the grass this like terrifying rhythm of approaching death yeah sam i agree i'm always disappointed when i'm reading a manga and there's no soundtrack <laughs> it's it's something i find lacking in most manga <laughs> I am comparing mediums, Matt. I don't expect the manga to have a soundtrack. I'm just saying this is an advantage of the anime that I enjoyed. I also think to a large extent, uh, to focus a little bit more on the manga, I think the intentions of the scene are a little bit different because it's just like it's it's a very tense scene in the um, anime. But the manga, I feel, does a really good job of um, establishing hierarchies and motivations relative to how crone fits into the rest of this like there's the there's the nuts and bolts plot element where crone says uh uh whilst uh like, like crone figures out and like isabella almost surely knows the two who were at the gate is two of three people and like so she knows who it was who's you know the ringleaders behind this and Crone's able to figure that out, too. So Crone's like, don't worry, I'm on your side. I know that, uh, you know, I know what you're trying to do. You saw the harvest. Yeah, she she uh, the harvest is is the uh, like, you know, arc word that she lets slip. It really does a good job of establishing Crone as like, like she's a she's a greed monster. Like like she is you know, coveting the position and like, you know, damn the consequences. And um, to a large extent, there's the moment where like she she has the tracker out. But when she's seeing, wow, these kids are actually really good at hiding their track, she closes it. That's a pretty selfish thing to do. Like she should just do her job. Like that's what she's there to do. She's there to, you know. That's, that's what I really like about Sister Crone is yeah. that she is... She is every bit as like super intelligent and like um, athletically gifted as like anyone else in this program, you can assume. She's just incredibly ambitious. And that is portrayed to the reader immediately. She's got ambition so much so that it's her downfall. But it's also the reason she's here in the first place. And it's also probably the reason Isabella wanted her here, because she knows she's ambitious. And as long as you know someone is gunning for your back, you're not paranoid by keeping an eye on them. Like <laughs> mm -hmm. the uh, the actual game of tag is uh, very tense and uh, very character informing because Emma tries to save uh, some of the younger kids, though it does end up slowing her down to the point where Crone catches her. But uh, Norman and Ray are able to uh, escape and win. And uh, that is actually where we end our reading. Yeah, I, I actually I actually love um, the uh, the moment like it's a moment for all three of them. And the sort of obvious one is Norman and Ray sort of establishing that like Crone is almost the kind of antagonist you would expect from a Shonen series where these kids legitimately played her. But um, the thing I really liked about the moment for Emma is she was like, this is a technically no stakes version of what's ultimately going to happen. So she's testing the waters. She knows that what she's trying to do is stupid and overreaching. So she's like, how far can I push this? 
you know, she's very sh- plucky shown in protag. But the fact that she has that hard analysis of, okay, this is how and why I pushed it too far. This is what I have to work on. It's not just lip service that Emma is a genius too. It shows the ways that she's smart. Like she's she's uh, quick to adapt to situations, quick to learn. But um, my, my favorite part is uh, the stinger we get for the end of our readings chapter is um, Norman just going, hey, so um, we could probably murder Sister Crow. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just ends on that. I'm like, well, cool. <laughs> I love, I love the way that this is visualized. Is a uh, uh, a trailed off sentence and uh, Ray twirling a fork and holding it, you know, yep. downward. <laughs> like uh. <laughs> this manga knows uh, other manga that use uh, subtlety, and and uh, they're all cowards. Also. <laughs> Norman, you just saw this woman punch through a tree. Uh, you... <laughs> she must go now. She must go now. She, she must go now. Her planet needs her. She must go fight the moon men. <laughs> <laughs> she must uh. go participate in the uh, the Lunar Civil War and fight Santa Claus. <sighs> We've come anyway. full circle. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, as with all shonen um, manga we read, uh, Let's uh, let's go into this uh, favorite character, everyone. Uh, let's start with you, Sam. Oh, boy. Uh, you know what? I actually have to say Isabella because I am reminded exactly how much I love to hate this villain by reading this. As I said before, it's been a few years since I since I originally watched the anime. The fact that seeing her again got such a visceral reaction of fear and hatred out of me just from seeing her face on a manga panel. It, really it was her, to, officer. It really speaks to how good of a character this is in in terms of just like com, uh, a completely well-written antagonist. And she facilitates the kind of like cards uh cards close to the chest uh espionage game thriller that i love so yeah i have to say isabella cool uh jay favorite character so now we're at the point um so emma really frustrated me so not her um i have to say ray ray is a solid choice we love our edgy boy i love the fact that he i don't know it's maybe because we're both equally cynical about things <laughs> yeah you find a kindred spirit in him yes all right uh matt how about you yeah uh so i gotta go with norman because uh he's great he steals the show the entire time he's in this um i just love him he's great the fact that he is so much smarter than everyone else and is like weighed down by like no i just want emma to be happy that's cool that sleepy smile he constantly has is also like this incredibly self-assured smile. It's the look of a man who is uh, a dozen steps ahead at all times. And exactly. I love it. Exactly. It's 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 just literally the face. Like that's the thing I think for Ray as well. They don't have childhood faces. I mean they do, but it's like these are men and young women. <laughs> They're- they're they're thinking they're thinking so far ahead they they've already done the math and yeah norm norman's great because it's like yeah but i'll figure it out (laughs) (laughs) i'm smart i got this (laughs) and jacob so to the surprise of no one emma Mm -hmm. probably didn't have to say it um though man i gotta tell you you know, because we've all seen the anime, we've all seen, uh, you know, ever so slightly. The anime adaptation is very close to the manga, but the presentation being as different as it is was such a cool experience. But like, man, getting Emma's more of Emma's internal monologue and like really showing showing the ways that she is so hardcore, exactly the plucky shonen pro tag she seems to be at first blush, but at the same time also is she lets herself make some of the like standard mistakes, but she also like analyzes them and, you know, like move and, and like works to move past them. She's, she's such a good expression of that character archetype in a series that she does not belong in. And I love that juxtaposition. Jay, I see you have a, 
a discussion point in here. Thoughts on uh, the theme and genre? Uh, sure. Um, so about this theme and genre, sure, I'll put myself out there. I have a twisted sense of humor, so I find this very hilarious. <laughs> 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 in a cosmic sort of way yes um yeah so i mean there have obviously been tropes of like invaders whether they be aliens demons what have you that feast on humanity but this is a twist of where it's like up front in your face they're literally eating humanity's children so it's just kind of like it is what it is um but i kind of really enjoyed that this was juxtaposed with like an actual um, intellectual attempt at an escape. Um, I really enjoy that part of, I, w- I, w- I don't know if you categorize this as a part of a shonen training arc, but I kind of liken it to that where it's like, we're getting introduced to the characters individually um, and how they contribute to the larger plot um, and kind of observing their character growth as they are, working towards conquering and overcoming this monumental, in this case, existential challenge. This is a genre that I really enjoy in a twisted way. Yeah. Uh, like I said, this is, uh, th- this is my favorite kind of thriller. It's that uh, constant interplay of tipping the hand and uh, working on the barest amount of information that you have. And at the same time, uh, it's as Jake keeps saying, Emma is absolutely in the wrong uh, story, but she brings so much optimistic shonen energy to it that she somehow, like, she doesn't alter the tone. I think if she were another straight man character, it probably would be bored with it. Yeah, yeah, she she injects energy into it that's very necessary to keep it at the pace it's going. I mean, without yeah. Emma, there wouldn't be a story because the three of them would just escape immediately. Like, yeah, the whole the whole caveat is that they're all super intelligent and like super athletic that they could just leave. But they're weighed down by wanting to help everyone. And that that sort of uh, believing that uh, even if it is uh, impossible or unrealistic or dangerous you know trying to do the the good thing is worthwhile and evil must be opposed in every way that we can not just the way that's uh the most convenient for us it uh adds a bit of light to this otherwise very cynical genre that i feel spices it up very well like regardless of how it ends like there's got to be some kind of hope. If it's all just morose all the time, then you know what's going to happen. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have that much impact when the bad thing happens. But if you if you dangle that morsel of hope in front of the audience that maybe it's going to turn out the way you want it to, you know, if it doesn't, sometimes when it doesn't, it hurts so much more. Honestly, my one of my big takeaways uh, from uh, revisiting this series, it's something that I think I passively understood. But like, you know, the manga does a really good job of emphasizing like the uh, the mundanity of evil. Like, mm-hmm. what if everybody except for the children was Shao Tucker? Basically, <laughs> the demon truck delivery guys like they were just dudes. <laughs> like They're, they're it, just guys. It's so it's so mind blowing. And like the the justifications that the two adult human people in this situation give to themselves to justify facilitating this unfathomable horror, you know, it's one of those ones where it's like if you have this because if you have this capacity, why wouldn't you act to oppose it? Right. You know, but it's it, it, like it's so easy for me to say, like sitting in the safe real world where this isn't happening, the ease with it with which it's all carried out that that speaks a lot to the like, you know, creeping dread that this series is so unbelievably good at. Well, we've all seen the season, the only season of the anime, the only one that exists. <laughs> yes, the only one that exists. We will not know. So do we want to talk about plot predictions? I I mean, I haven't seen, I haven't read, there's still a whole bunch of chapters left. So 
Well, I mean, we can start with the fact that, hey, do you think they make a great escape and are successful, not as successful? That's really the the blade of Damocles, isn't it? It's getting out of the farm is one thing. Surviving out there is another. Much like the characters, we don't know what the world outside looks like. Like, we know there's enough infrastructure and system in place to have this this uh you know cabal of demons working to harvest veal children it, it's you know there's all that but they have all this secrecy about it so it implies that they don't have utter dominance of the entire world or or but that that could also just be because it's through the uh, everything we're seeing is through the lens of the kids as the characters, and all they know is the farm. So all they know is the secrecy. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I feel like Ray's definitely read some survival guides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose the real question becomes, when they get out, is there going to be this uh, guerrilla warfare you know, living in the forest uh, is, or will they like join up? Uh, will or, they find? Uh, will they find people to to live with, and will that be the new conflict? And, and will they find demons going to Demon Costco and getting you know half off Connie's? <laughs> um, one of the, one of the elements of the of the world I find the most compelling is how did the world get to the state where a farm like this is possible? Like how much time is pa- how much time has really passed, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because they they think it's been thirty years since uh you know twenty fifteen. They have some ways of of getting a rough estimate, but like we don't know uh how we don't know how widespread it is, and we don't know uh, how long it's been in that state. I I think it speaks to the idea of like is this a um. Uh, a fantasy series with demons from hell coming to eat people, or is this a, uh, a science fiction story with aliens doing it? Cause that, that sort of um, informs a lot of like how quickly uh, has the world changed and uh, in what ways has it changed like outside of their sequestered little space. Mm-hmm. This is just an isolated event too. Well, I mean, we know there's at least three farms because this is farm three. Yeah, but what I mean is, like, I'm thinking especially in larger expanses. Like, this could be out in the wilderness somewhere, and, you know, I don't know if there are other untouched areas, you know? Like, it could just be, like I like I mentioned, the village. I mean, that's what, um, that's what uh, the, the main trio discuss, is whether or not, like, th- these people are being stolen from an existing human society. And, like the demons are doing this to breed their own humans because they can't, like, full-on beat the humans in war or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is it like this everywhere? Yeah, like, it... Again, it's like, what are the demons? (laughs) Yes. Are we just, you know, selectively unlucky or are we all just unlucky, you know? It's just kind of like... It's uh, embrace the suck, but how much does this suck for humanity? <laughs> Unrelated. Embrace the suck. Good title for a porn. Well, uh, we'll use it as an episode of Cis Confidential. Yep. Embrace the suck. Gotta be God. such a good Cis Confidential title. Damn it. I'm telling you, this is just an Oh very- my God, because those manga suck too. Dang it. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is just an ex- this is an extended planning meeting for Cis Confidential. Thank you. You're making it more real. Stop it. So, uh, would you continue reading? Uh, for me, absolutely. Uh, this has uh, absolutely rekindled my my enjoyment of this series. Yeah, you know, it had been it had been lurking in the back of my brain for a while. Now, I absolutely want to keep reading up to the point where the anime ends because as we know, season two isn't real, and then figure out what happens after that. Uh, Jake, how about you? Uh, oh, yeah, no, I I absolutely loved reading this in large part because whilst the nuts and bolts story is nearly identical to the anime I've already watched, the way it's presented gives so much 
it, it gives a unique perspective that is it does a lot to like reframe and make the story fresh in its own way. Honestly, it speaks to how good the adaptation of at least season one. Again, I haven't seen season two. I'll withhold my judgment whether or not it exists when I get there. Um, but uh, like, like what a good adaptation in that it like, like, you know, we lost a little bit of, I feel uh, the whole, the whole of Emma's character, but like in exchange and, and like some of the world building in exchange, we got a more like viscerally intense experience. So man, I would love to more directly engage with like the mystery of the world that the manga seems more interested in because of the different media. All right, uh, Matt, how about you? Uh, yeah, I, w- I would love to continue reading this. Um, I think I'm going to disagree with Jacob slightly where he's just like the intensity is a little higher for the uh, anime, I believe, was your statement. Yeah, it, it, Correct me yeah, if- I I feel like the tension so, uh, is a little bit better. I, I would say I prefer the tension in the manga because <laughs> it, it is it keeps you intensely reading through those 19 chapters and then gives you a sting. And then the next chapter is just as intense. Whereas the anime kind of goes through a more natural, like, kind of curve. Ebb, ebb and flow, yeah. It's a different kind yeah. of tension. And, like, as I was reading, like, the entire cause short amount of reading, I did it all in one sitting. I'm like, oh, geez, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. this this is made to be, like, a like dose of super intensity you read once a week. So doing it all at once was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the the only thing that kept me from binging this all in one sitting was I was I was busy this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that actually is a uh, a, a good point where uh, I prefer the kind of tension from the anime, but the manga has a different and equally, you know, equally high quality type of tension that uh, is truly extraordinary. It um it it is the same kind of genre as uh, another thing that I keep mentioning. I'll get us to read on the podcast, but I keep hemming and hawing if I really want to subject you guys to it. Uh, Blood on the tracks, where each chapter you don't think it's going to get worse, and, and then it does. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the the legend we have yet to be subjected to. Abandon all hope. Uh, and Jay, would you continue reading? Oh, absolutely. I mean, literally, um, like everyone else here, I also watched the anime and I enjoyed the anime. Uh, I have not seen season two. I've heard, of course, bad things. Um, But I really enjoyed, you know, reading the manga on this one because I have to agree with what everyone else has said. It is very tense. I have to say that the dynamic and severe reactions are played up in the manga which is not unusual but um kind of garnered a more severe reaction for myself um like i said i i it was a combination of fear coupled with maniacal laughter because it was just that outrageous and i'm like oh my gosh (laughs) so um i have to say absolutely and hopefully the manga holds true to being more um enjoyable than i suppose season two of the anime you know usually i have that to look forward to so and especially the fact that we're left on a huge cliffhanger all righty and uh thank you everyone once again for listening to the over manga cast as always you can find us uh on all of your social medias we are at over manga cast on facebook twitter and instagram whichever one of those is still up uh, we are also on YouTube, uh, where you can like, comment, and subscribe. The episodes are on a two-week delay, but on OverMangaCast.com, uh, they're all up to date, so you can catch up with our uh, episodes in either place and uh, leave us any comments on any uh, anything that uh, we made you think about. We also appreciate reviews in any and all forms. Uh, if you can go ahead and do that on iTunes, a podcatcher of choice, or just go ahead, email us. Uh, we're overmangacast at gmail.com. Love hearing from you guys. And, you know, if you have something you think we'd like to read or something that we haven't read in a while and you'd like us to revisit, go ahead. Worst we can say is no. And I don't think we've ever done that yet. <laughs> Indeed, we haven't. And uh, speaking of things that we haven't read in a while, This was too tense, guys. How about we just uh, 
read something nice and uh <laughs> nice and popcorn-y. nice and calm and fun yeah nice and wholesome For, um, yeah. <laughs> some uh well <sighs> You know what fixes all the world world's problems? Polyamory. We're reading a hundred girlfriends who really, 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 really love you. Chapters twenty one through thirty eight. Happy early Valentine's Day, everybody. We'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs> Good, Good night, everyone. You see, the joke is you're single and alone because he has all the girlfriends. I knew that's why I wasn't getting late. Damn it. That well, explains if, he, it. Yeah. if he doesn't, he's the golden boy. If not, their lives are irreparably doomed. Just have a- No, they just die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just too good. He can't let them die. Yeah. That's really the summary of that thing. You don't go watch the first episode. You got a week. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. yeah. There's kiss zombies. I'm not going to explain what that is. It's um, it's a thing that does something. in fact happen. <laughs> yep. Stop! Stop listening to us. Go. Gotta get. Go. Okay. Go listen to it right now. Go, go listen. Go listen to us in the past. Guys, they're they're not leaving. I'm scared. That's fine. I'll make them leave right now. Cut. Am I trapped here forever? Are the demons watching us? Cut. 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 No. Sam, your powers don't work here. <laughs> We're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>